maven, an expert, an authority, a connoisseur, a specialist, a professional, a knowledge king, a rock and roll sports talker. Coons Ford of Security Boulevard is proud to present The Sports Maven with Bruce Posner, a no-holds-barred look at the sports world. Now, here's Bruce Posner, The Sports Maven. Any Saturday, or as Dennis Kalatsis from Coons Ford says, liquid sunshine. Listen, uh, Danny just started off the hour to me to start a rumor that Jose Mourinho will become the USA soccer coach after that thrubbing they took from Brazil yesterday. Uh, wow. Two to nothing, but it wasn't even that close. All right. Listen, big show today. We got the the Terps tonight in what we call a trap game. Then we have the Ravens tomorrow opening up. And it's, not, it's supposed to be light rain off and on. So it won't be bad tomorrow for those of you uh, going to the game. But we're going to open up the show today with, I thought, one of the best moments of the year in sports. And that was the induction uh, enshrinement of Lefty Drizel into the Basketball Hall of Fame in Springfield, Massachusetts. I'm going to bring in another old timer with me, my good buddy Todd Carton, to speak about this. Todd, you there? Yeah, I am, Bruce. Thanks for qualifying me as an old timer. Well, we're old time. I'm an older old timer than you, but you're. Uh, oh. Oh, I'm old, no question. Yeah, you're definitely an old-timer. And uh, real quick update, the Maryland soccer game last night against UCLA, which was probably sold out, was postponed because of the rain. And they right. will play today at noon. Is that a given? That's uh, Well, that's what's on the schedule right now. And, and I, I think the weather will let them play that today. Uh, busy day in college parks. Field hockey is playing. Volleyball opens their season. And as soon as I get off the phone with you, I'm headed over there. All right. So you're a busy guy today covering everything for uh, Terp Talk. And, uh, you know, as you do such a great job. Lefty speech last night. I thought the highlight of his speech was when he said, when you were 86, remembering names and going to the bathroom control your life. <laughs> You know, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that, Bruce, because that was one of the things I noted, and I thought, man, I'm only 64, and remembering names and going to the bathroom controls my life. Only Lefty would come up with that. I, <laughs> did you find it curious that his three presenters, now you've got to remember, the presenters are from the Hall of Fame, so it's not like he could just go out and grab somebody, but the three presenters, certainly George Ravelling, you knew would be there. His best friend, his assistant coach for years, and uh, just a wonderful basketball guy and a wonderful guy. But Coach K and John Thompson, did you find that a little strange? Uh, I, I found Coach K a little strange, but maybe it was the Duke connection that uh, had Lefty doing that. I, I really didn't find John Thompson that strange, and I thought that when Lefty talked about it, he said, you know, we used to beat up on Georgetown all the time until they hired John Thompson, and you all never heard of Georgetown until they hired John Thompson, and then he started beating us, and I wouldn't play him anymore. I thought it was pretty funny. Yeah, but I, I don't know how true that was. I mean, you know, maybe it was partially true, but uh, the real feud started with Joe Smith, and the, oh, feud, yeah. and the feud was really between Lefty and, uh, and, and John Thompson was really between Gary and John Thompson. Gary, no, Gary took it to another level, all right? But whatever. You know, but but I think that that's, that's kind of, again, I thought the whole speech was kind of typical lefty. It was a little bit self It was a plenty self-deprecating, which is where lefty has come to in his life. I don't know that he's always been that way, but he's certainly there now. And, and I think that that, that was part of it. But when he, with George Raveling, when he said, oh, I'm good, he credited George Raveling with coming up with Midnight Madness. And he said, oh, yeah, I'm not smart enough to come up with that idea. That was, I mean, you know, for every, nobody's ever thought about Raveling having the idea. So Lefty spilled the beans at this point. Uh, I thought the interesting part of it was when he started and talked about the fact that he was a manager at nine years old. Nine years old. Incredible. Right. And he sat through, he played three sports in high school, and he sat through hundreds, maybe thousands of like uh, coaching sessions. And I, he kind of insinuated that that's where he got his acumen from, or that's where it started. Uh, playing three sports, 
you know, and, and the fact that you kind of, back then and back when, you know, I was in high school and I'm sure when you were, you really had one coach. You never had a staff. I mean, I, I, I mean, my, when I played basketball at Northwestern, my coach, Sam Liger, uh, he didn't have a staff. He didn't have assistants. Maybe a couple dads. Sure. He didn't have anything. It was him. And yeah, those, they had nothing. These guys had nothing. He ran practice. I mean, he did, you know, he did it all. You didn't have any kind of a staff. And even, them. look, Lefty had rivaling, and that was it. And and most most of those guys back in our day, uh, Bruce were were also teachers. Teach. A, a lot of them, they had you know they were teachers, they were phys ed teachers, and they coached the football team. Or you know, for me, it was uh, I, I I was I played tennis in high school, and I, I forget now what my what the tennis coach taught, but you know, taught history or something. No, it, it's a, even. I tell you what, even today you see a lot of that in some of the uh, non Olympic sports in high school. Uh, some of the Olympic sports, rather, uh, where, you know, a guy has no assistance. He just does it himself. But uh, parents do volunteer now with the uh, interest. But uh, I just thought that that was interesting that, that would, that's what he grew on. And, of course, he named all his superstars and all the guys who, uh, you know, helped make his career and, you know, pay tribute to the four colleges where he coached. And uh, where, he, where he's the only coach to win a, a hundred games at four colleges. Correct, but uh, you know he reminded everybody of his twenty-seven and three record at Georgia State, <laughs> which is almost—it's absolutely incredible. All and right, it, and his fifty-seven straight wins as a high school coach, which he took a couple of very funny jabs at at Moses Malone and uh, was it maybe Alonzo Mourning or somebody. Saying, yeah, you won fifty four or you won fifty two, but my team won fifty seven. Yeah, he was. And he, he did pay tribute to Moses by saying that, uh, you know, by Moses not playing at Maryland, because of course he went to the ABA uh, for us, a, a then a big contract, and Lefty yeah. helped Lefty helped negotiate that. If you've read a lot about Lefty, which you know, I not only know him, but I've also read about him because his career is so expansive that. You can't know him through all the phases. It's almost impossible. But, you know, it's amazing it took till he was 86 to get into the Hall of Fame. It really is. I, I agree 100% with, with that. Uh, you know, we're, we're all just in the Maryland community, I think, and, and probably Davidson and maybe Duke and Georgia State and uh, where every place Lefty has been is probably happy that, you know, we're just thrilled that it happened while he was still living. Yeah, and uh, some of the other, yeah, of course, uh, Danny brought that up to me beforehand, that how absurd is it that, you know, that some of these guys get in the year after they die into the Hall of Fame, and it's, you know, that they weren't able to enjoy it. And while we had Lefty on the show, I know you remember, Todd. Yeah, and one of his, the great shows. Yeah, he, when you talk about it, bullion and happy and proud and everything else, those words don't even come close to, to talking about how, uh, how great Lefty felt about making, uh, about making the, the Hall of Fame, the Naismith Hall of Fame. Uh, there's the College Basketball Hall of Fame, which he's in, but uh, this is the Hall of Fame, and uh, what a class he went in with. Holy cow. I, yeah. I, you know, I watched, I, for those of you who haven't watched it, it's a replay today at 12 o'clock, and I know there's a lot on TV, and there's not much to do outside, I'll tell you that, but TiVo it, or whatever, you know, DVR it, and watch it. The speeches were great. I, I thought that Ray Allen was fantastic, and... Uh, Steve Nash was great, and Jason Kidd was off the off the charts. But I thought Lefty stole the show as he always does, and as we he had the NBA players hysterical. He did. They were they were probably as close to coming to rolling in the aisles as, as they could have been. I think they were. He really did, and he kept talking about I'm going over. Everybody went over long. I'm go. Is my time up? He was just funny. Yeah, and though I thought the best line of the whole speech was when he said to Shashevsky after talking about the fact that, you know, high school coaches, you know, didn't have assistants and he had one assistant. He said, How many assistants do you have, Mike? A <laughs> hundred? Like a <laughs> hundred. <laughs> yeah, uh, he he was he was just uh, you know, it was pure lefty. What can you say? It was 
That's the only way to describe it, isn't it, Bruce? Yeah, for sure. And I sure believe that those guys were quite honored to be up there. So maybe when you have John Thompson, maybe his thought was to have John Thompson and Coach K up there along with himself. These are two of considered the best coaches ever in college basketball. And maybe, you know, that's where Lefty wanted to put his place in. Because he hasn't had that reputation, although we feel that way. And uh, what he did at Maryland was just off the charts. And the fun that he produced and the spirit lives on today where uh, he really turned Maryland into a basketball school for, for good. And uh, just super. I can't, I can't tell you, Bruce, kind of skimming around the, the Internet. I was trying to catch up on some things because my – uh, service went down yesterday, but when I got home from a field hockey banquet last night, uh, I was kind of surfing the internet, and I can't tell you how many times I saw the comment of Lefty Drizel coming to Maryland turned me into a Maryland basketball fan. Saw it over and over and over again. So, you know, I mean, a lot of the old guys, you like us, and 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 that's true. Lefty Lefty made Maryland basketball. Well, I remember in my freshman year at College Park, I would go to a basketball game and you'd be playing, you know, Duke or Carolina. Maybe those were the two exceptions, but anybody else, you could walk in at halftime and what was it, half filled, Coldfield yeah. House, and uh, you could be as short of a loss and uh, against a really good team. And uh, Maryland basketball was just another team, and Lefty came. And everything changed overnight. And first, it was the recruitment of uh, Tom McMillan and Lenny Elmore. That and John Lucas, right? That really turned on the the student body right away and sold out the place. And it was just overnight that Maryland basketball. And when he said that Maryland basketball was going to be the UCLA of the East. That's what did it. And it was just great last night. So I implore everybody. It's on YouTube. It'll be on our website. TerpTalk.com. It'll be everywhere. You won't miss it. But take 30 minutes. If you don't want to watch the rest of the NBA people, uh, watch Lefty because it was uh, really, really special. And, uh, you know, that's all I can say about it. So today, Maryland faces Bowling Green after a great Texas win last week that we really talked about for almost an hour on Wednesday. And uh, we call this a trap game. All right. And for those of you who don't know what a trap game is, tell them, Todd. Well, you know, for me, a trap game is almost more a game that where, where you've had the big upset and you have a big game the following week and, uh, and you're, you potentially suffer a letdown in the middle um, because you're playing an inferior team. And I think this one is, is a, a Trap game in the sense that Maryland certainly could come off come off as a, a letdown because last week's game was so so emotional uh, that whether or not they can they can get up to play Bowling Green who they feel like they should beat is is another question altogether you know and and it's going to be a, it's a small stadium it's in Bowling Green uh, they, you know there's a, there's a lot and Bowling Green has a terrible defense but they can. They can move the ball. There's no question they can move the ball. Well, it, it takes me back to a game when Maryland went to Northern Illinois. You remember that? And I, I think the stadium might hold, what, 15,000, 20,000 people? And they got their butts kicked. And it's and what happened last week will be greatly diminished with a loss at Bowling Green. And the fact that Maryland is a 16-point favorite is absolutely absurd. It is beyond absurd. And the biggest thing that's absurd, Todd, I'll just get your opinion on this. I'm going to just name, pick out 10 things here and read them, and you tell me how absurd it is, what my point is. How about uh, Liberty and Army, uh, Western Michigan and Michigan, Nevada and Vanderbilt, Albany at Rhode Island, uh, uh, let's see here, Arkansas State at Alabama, Lafayette at Delaware, East Tennessee State at Tennessee, Fordham at Richmond, Sanford at Florida State, Southern Louisiana at LSU, Wyoming at Missouri, Florida International at Old Dominion, West uh, uh, Western Illinois at Illinois, uh, Utah at Northern Illinois, Fresno State at Minnesota, all these games are on TV today for free. <laughs> and the Maryland game, you have to pay for. 
Yeah. I mean, what kind of malarkey is this? There's, I'm telling you, there's 40 football games on TV today, maybe 30, okay? And Maryland, you have to pay for it. I thought the Big Ten Network was going to cut that garbage out. Well, for, it has for the most part, but, you know, I mean, I don't, I, the, 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 the co- these contracts are so strange, and, and why ESPN relegated Maryland to this ESPN Plus platform that uh, costs 60 bucks a year or whatever it is, uh, is, is beyond me. Um, you know, maybe, maybe ESPN is still out looking to punish Maryland. Who knows? I don't know, but you, you guys have both watched other, uh, you know, non-rev sports and found them on the old ESPN3 platform where they would have the online, you'd, they'd force you to watch online, but they wouldn't charge you. Now they, they are. They, they, this is ridiculous. This is absolutely ridiculous, and I'd be furious as a Maryland. As, as any member school of the Big Ten, I'd be furious, the fact that you would have to pay an additional fee when you're already paying for the Big Ten network. Well, it's the sh- Big sh- Ten network makes a deal with ESPN and Fox Sports 1, right? and, and that's how this happens. Because the Big Ten, you, the Big Ten Network does not have the capacity to show every Big Ten game. Well, I understand that, but that's why they should still have it for free online. I mean, that's. I mean, it's, you're it's, right. It's now the standard because the English Premier League changed the same thing. They have a couple available just online, but for a lot of the smaller t- teams, for the smaller matchups, they have it on their pay well, service. Todd and things. myself, Todd and myself, uh, subscribe to the Maryland uh, BTN Plus. And I don't even think it's on there. I think it's on ESPN Plus, which is another. It, it is on ESPN Plus. That's the thing. And ESPN Plus, Danny, has gone to this model where essentially ESPN, what used to be ESPN3, which came in as if you had ESPN3, your cable right. package, you no longer have that. It's just, it's a kind of a standalone platform, and, and you have to pay for it. And then you get. It's not just the Maryland game. You you get everything. It's you know five dollars a month. It, I'm not saying it's a bad deal, but it, it, for for these local viewers, it, it stinks. It, yeah, for it's the not average fair. person who doesn't watch a lacrosse game, right? All right, like it's you and me do. Plus is great, but yeah, I mean, I, I'm not saying it's bad, and I you know I'll be a buyer. But in other words, for the average person who just follows football and basketball, not to have this game on TV is it's ridiculous. And here's the kicker. That's a different point, that, and that's a good point, Bruce, because of the minor games that you pointed out that are on TV. Well, here's two games that are on TV today on ESPN. Here, here's one. All right, men's soccer. Now, you could say maybe USA playing, or you could stretch your imagination and say, well, let's watch Mexico, since uh, there's certainly interest in Mexico in this country or England. Well, here's a game that's on instead of the Maryland game. Northern Ireland versus Bosnia and Herzegovina. That's on ESPN. Uh, that's on, let me see here, ESPN News. I don't even, yeah, ESPN News. Northern Ireland versus Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Maryland is not on. I, and I uh, they put that up for uh, even Bender. I don't know. <laughs> From Bosnia and Herzegovina. And even in your, now here's another one. Arizona and New Mexico State. That's on the Florida Sports Channel, which some people get in their packages. All right. Well, guess what? All right. That's volleyball. No offense, Todd. <laughs> no <laughs> offense. But volleyball over the Maryland game. You know, it, it's to me, it, it, it borderlines insanity. All right. I'll leave it at that. Todd, any other comments before we go? Uh, just that, um, you know, there was a big article in the Washington Post this morning by Roman Stubbs and Rick Mays about the potential cost of the football crisis, not to bring it down. Uh, but, you know, I was at this field hockey banquet last night, and everybody in, associated with Maryland Athletics is aware of it because when Missy spoke to us, when some of the team members spoke to us, they all talked about sort of the cloud that's hanging over Maryland and it's a situation that somehow has got to get resolved and resolved as quickly as possible. I think it will be. I think it will be resolved, by, I would hope, by the end of September at the latest, maybe even sooner. And you're right. It will be, you know, we it will have to get it behind us and move on because uh, I know they're waiting for a huge football recruit to uh, commit to Maryland today or, or whenever. But uh, it, it's got to move on. It just has to. And uh, I thought all the tributes to Jordan last week were fantastic, especially uh, 100%. especially the first play of the game. That was 
uh, you know, almost like the lonesome right guard. I thought that was just it, priceless. It was just fantastic. Quite an honor. Todd, thanks a lot for coming on today, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Have a great day out at College Park. Thanks. Always a pleasure, Bruce. All right. With that, we'll head out to our first break. Uh, this is Bruce Posner. You are listening to Coons Ford Presents the Sports Maven. This Saturday, every Saturday here on CBS Sports Radio, 1300. And I have to tell you, Danny, great day to buy a car today. Nothing else <laughs> to do. I mean, Maryland's not on TV till 6, and they're not on TV, period. But uh, Go have lunch. Go have lunch out there. Have a great lunch. Pick out your car and uh, have a great day. With that, we'll head out to our first break. Welcome back to Sports Maven, presented by Coons Ford of Security Boulevard. Now, once again, here's Bruce Posner, the Sports Maven. Well, tomorrow's the day, Danny. The NFL starts, and uh, the uh, you almost can't talk enough about it. But, you know, it's funny. I was on my way over here, and I don't, you know, I'm not going to overkill the NFL because in the nest starts tomorrow. Absolutely. And I want everybody to tune in at 9 o'clock. Science at Kirk presents in the nest and there is so much to talk about uh, Ravens-wise. But the first thing I thought about is the one true question mark to be on the Ravens could be the injury, or could he get injured again, and that's Marshall Yonda. And, and you know, he hasn't played one second of preseason. He, you know, who's to say that something doesn't happen? I mean, he's no not battle-tested. And how will that affect the team? You know, my opinion on that is I think that this is probably Marshall's last year. I think that he has broken down too many times in recent years, and I think that he is. No, if he goes through this year healthy, I disagree. Well, that may be, but I think that he's going into this year with his number one goal of being as available as possible. And, uh, you know, um, not not to plug my own podcast, but we had Jason Lockenfor on the Be More Opinionated podcast predict this year that if, if Marshall Yonda somehow plays 15 plus games, this team is definitely going to the uh, the playoffs because he is such a uh, a unifying force and just a, a stabilizer on that line, and he brings together what is otherwise a kind of young and uncertain line. I uh, I'm not sure, Bruce. I I think that Yonda, given the fact that he was given basically a full year and a half to prepare for this. I mean, there was no need for him to play during the preseason, even though they had five opportunities to play him. Um, he, I think he's going to be fine, and he is. But I agree with you. He is a huge piece. I also think that the injury to Hayden Hurst is just painful. Yeah, and how bad is it? That's the other thing. I mean, like, I mean, and, and that's the sort of, like, questionable, like, lingering type of injury. I mean, like, I, I'm not invoking Max Williams' name because I think the injuries are similar. I'm not saying the trajectories are similar. But you really want to see a uber-talented tight end, top tight end target Could prospect Could Mark like Andrews that. be that kid? Let's hope so. I think that would be an awesome opportunity for Andrews, especially after his but camp he's, started you slow. You know, depth chart, he's third. Understood. But listen, I of think— Of course, three tight ends play every game, so it doesn't matter, really. Actually, four would if, if Hurst was playing. Joe Harbaugh and Marty have gotten a lot of opportunities to see Nick Boyle and Max Williams in the last couple of years. And I think there's a reason why, uh, you know, they still drafted two tight ends. But thankfully, uh, we'll see. Well, Boyle's had the drug problem. Yes, absolutely. And Williams had tons and, of in injury problems. Right. But so I, I, I don't think there was a choice. They had to draft some tight ends. Uh Tell me, give me your take on Buffalo. Uh, I Worst mean, you, team in football. They will be l lucky to win four games this year. Look, I, I saw. I'm going to interrupt you. And okay, I'll let you it. talk. I saw a review of the Bills, and it said that the first line was Nathan Peterman is starting a quarterback. Yeah. And the first comment from a, a guy, a gambler, right. was that that says it all. It does. However, I mean, again, Elvin Benjamin it, is pretty damn good. Yeah, and you want to give a little bit of benefit of the doubt, and the fact of the matter is Nathan Peterman was the best-playing quarterback on the Bills in the preseason. Now, that might not be saying much. Apparently, Josh Allen has not had the sort of Sam Darnold or, I mean, like, listen, no one was exa exactly saying that Lamar Jackson absolutely killed it in the preseason, but he made plays at least. I mean, Josh yeah, Allen Yeah, but you wouldn't struggled. want to start the season with him. If something was wrong with Joe... RG3 would start the season. Uh, you're, you're, start the season, you're probably right. But I think that the Bills are, you know, I know some Bills fans are 
have have some schadenfreude towards Nathan Peterman. I mean, Bills fans are split. They're, they're kind of like the Washington fans over RG3, but with a lesser degree with Tyrod Taylor. They're super split on him. And uh, when the team basically uh, unilaterally, with, with no real cause, made the switch to Nathan Peterman last year, obviously we all saw the result of, of Nathan throwing, at what, five interceptions he in the first half? He had a bad game. He had a bad game. Right, but he's, he's probably not as bad as his reputation could, precedes Could not be him. that bad. However... If the Ravens somehow come out all fires blazing and sack him four or five times and force two or three turnovers in the first half, we might see Josh Allen in the second half and we'll make him turn the ball over too. Because it look, look like to Josh me, Allen's ready either. You know, there are some guys who possibly can start. To me, watching Baker Mayfield, I think of everybody, he's the most ready. All right. Now, I didn't study Sam Darnold, but Baker Mayfield is not starting. All right, he's not starting. No, and uh, but to me, he's the most ready, and the best thing in the world for him, him is not starting. Absolutely, because it, what are they playing Pittsburgh? Yeah, you know, and he, you need your wits about you when you're playing Pittsburgh. And, under the learning and tree, and Tyrod is certainly uh, more than capable of holding Absolutely. his own. So uh, no, the, the Browns are not going to be awful this year. But f- but going back to the Bills. Uh, they have probably the worst O line in uh, in football, which is very tough to deal with. With the uh, and it could be a really good opportunity for the Ravens to get off on the good foot with rushing the passer, which was a you know a touch and go thing for a lot last year. They relied very uh, heavy and early on Terrell Suggs, and you would like to see maybe this year. You know what, tomorrow, what I would like to see is a sack from Timmy Williams or Tyus Bowser. I think one of those players getting a sack tomorrow would be a really big statement um, for the team going forward. And I don't know what you think, Bruce, but, but this is as excited I've been for a week one in probably three or four years, probably since the Super Bowl year. I mean, I, I, this really feels well, like I, an opportunity I know what, to be a different team. I know what causes that excitement. Was well, Lamar. No, it's 41 and 100. 41 and 100. What's that? I don't know. You'll know. You I know, know what it is. Think it's the Orioles' record. <laughs> All right. Oh, dude, I don't know how that didn't register instantly. I just, forty-one I, that's cognitive dissonance, right? Forty-one there. and a hundred. All right, which to me I think is on pace for a hundred and seven. I mean, forty-seven and one fifteen. And Buck unfortunately goes down in that uh, era of managers. Oh yeah, who lost a hundred games? He can't be happy about it. Nope. And there's twenty-one left. I mean, I. He, they're not going to lose 120 like the 62 Mets. All right, they'll get a four or five wins, I would think. Maybe more. You would think. I'm not positive. You would though. think. I'm not positive. But, no, but uh, you're, no, you, there is something to that. But I, I also, I genuinely think that there's a, a tide turning with this Ravens team. Now, I might be com- completely wrong. Maybe tomorrow. Because, listen, Joe is still the quarterback. And you want to believe that this new wide receiver core is going to have a very fun time tomorrow. You just named, that's funny, I was reading the Sun Papers before we started the show, and you named the number one and number two things that could go right and things that could go wrong. If this group of receivers turns out to be the same kind of guys who can't get open... Like last year? Yeah. If we're going to get, we'll, get another five and a half per attempt Joe Flacco season, and that is it. Yeah. Uh, as soon as you see that Joe Flacco... It's over. It's it, over. And and Whether it's his fault or right, not, exactly. it's over. And, and we need to see a different Joe and listen people were very very excited to report from training camp and that one drive that he had during the preseason that's like oh Joe looks like he's in the best shape of his career which is the worst phrase you could ever hear in preseason in any here's, sport here's the only thing though I think back to the last time he was in a contract year or a contract situation and he is this year he definitely is because if he doesn't play well it's over Joe came through with flying colors. Listen, I think Joe could have a really awesome year. I could see John Brown just transcending and being a great third option. I could see Michael Crabtree being the alpha dog. Some, also, some, why would all of a sudden Crabtree turn into a horrible player? I mean, no, it's not, it's not I mean, conceivable. Well, listen, in the NFL, that sort of thing, unfortunately, is quickly. always conceivable. It but happens quickly. I don't see that happening. But again, if tomorrow ends up being one of those 
17 to 9, 12 to 3 wins that feels like a loss. There's going to be a lot of wind coming out of that stadium, which is unfortunate because, you know, if tomorrow's uh, weather. Listen, yeah, listen. listen we're, I disagree, but the go attendance ahead. thing is going to be another narrative this year, especially if, again, if they don't show that they have a different brand of football coming our way. Because, listen, a lot of people want to talk about the na- the anthem and stuff. And yes, we, we talked that to death last year. It was a factor. It, we, there's no doubt it was a factor. But the biggest factor I still maintain is the fact that no one wanted to go out in miserable weather to watch a miserable-looking team. Even if it was competitive, it was miserably-looking football. Yeah, I, I think that uh, they might have gotten a break on that because it was kind of sidelined with all the anthem stuff. But That was the excuse people used. But, but like this, look, everybody's looking forward to this game. Right. And if you go to StubHub right now, you can buy a ticket for half price. All right? It's not eight dollars or anything like right. that, but you can buy a ticket for fifty bucks. Yeah. 40 I, I, bucks. I, re- I regret buying my ticket as long ago as I did, but you know, I'm where are you ha- sitting? I'm sitting in the lower bowl in the corner. I'm very excited. All right, that's well, that's still a hundred dollar ticket, so I don't know what you paid. hundred. I, I have hundred forty or so. That's I'll, what I'll it's going it. for. Yeah. So you didn't, you know. Uh, no, basically, I'm, I'm excited, though, man. I'm so, by the time I was not going to miss that game for the world. By the time the fees are taken out, and you'll wind up if you sold the ticket for that you get about what the value of the ticket is. So there is interest here, but in the upper reaches, there's not right. interest. They're not sold. There are seats Did you action. get to go any of the preseason games? No, I did not go. See, I'm, One I'm, of them, I'm, I'm I was, excited to see the new stadium atmosphere with the new st- notches, uh, the new screens and the notches and stuff like that. That's going to be really interesting to well, see. Well, to me, I don't know what the real attendance was there, but watching on TV, it didn't look that strong. But you know what? Uh, let's win, and I think you'll see let's the attendance. Let's have the rain hold off, too. Yeah. That would be really a, a well, nice The way it's been well. going, I mean, it'll probably pour, you know, because <laughs> if it pours, I won't go. I mean, it's that simple. I'm not going to sit in the pouring down rain. You're not too, because you're, it's you're, you're too old, Bruce. Listen, not can't because you getting pneumonia first week of the NFL season. Listen, not because it's the Ravens, just because I would sit in the rain for anything. Right. If you're it too was old. A, if it was a national, if it was a championship game, I'd sit in the rain. But I might not even do that anymore. All right, after that, let me tell you, after that Cincinnati game last year, (laughs) I'm telling, not the fact that we lost. Come on, man. It was so cold that I said to myself, that's it. I'm done. I said, I'm not sitting in this crazy weather anymore. Not when I can let. Say it, Bruce, you're getting too old for this. Well, it could be. But listen, I'm not too old to sit at home and watch (laughs) my 65 inch perfect picture screen. Absolutely. All right. And uh, I'm not too old for that. Of course. You know? And that's it, and not having to buy nine dollar beers and whatever. <laughs> but I tell you what, you can get tomorrow. Admins will be open in section 118, and uh, like it's taken over the Orioles this year as the number one concession stand in the stadium. Beef? You cannot get roast beef. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. You have to go to find out uh, an eighteen dollar sandwich on the club level. No, I'm all right. Beef. I'm okay. I'm, I'll still go to Adams. You'll be ta- I'll stop by. Hey, you're, you'll be tailgate. You'll be fine. All right. With that, let's go to our second break. Bruce Posner, Danny uh, could do helping out today. Uh, back in a few minutes on CBS Sports. This is the Sports Maven Show, presented by Coons Ford of Security Boulevard. Now, here's the Maven himself, Bruce Posner. Hey, dude. What's going on, man? All right. We're talking a little about uh, the Kaepernick situation. And uh, it is what it is. It is what it is. And I think overall for... for, uh, Nike, you have to remember, Nike is a worldwide brand. They're a worldwide brand. Yeah, they don't really care about the Harford County uh, people who aren't going to buy their clothing anymore, unfortunately. They just don't. Well, you can't can't classify everybody who is or isn't, right? right? But in this town, it's weird because I haven't bought a Nike product in a long time, but it's got nothing to do with a boycott. It's because we're an Under Armour town. Absolutely. All right? And I believe that Under Armour employs so many people here. And uh, Kevin Plank's done so much for the city and so much for the University of Maryland. You know, know, that's where my take comes on it. But, uh, you know, I don't know how it's going to affect it. A lot of people have given up season tickets. A lot of it has to do with what you said, the rain, the TV, you know, all that stuff. And yet, I think there's an excitement for the team this year that is, uh, like you said, uh, off the charts. Absolutely. And I sure hope every game sold out. And uh, 
you know, everything is peaceful at the games, which it will be, and uh, we'll take it from there. I, I think I think everyone's excited to root for the Ravens together. I, I don't think we're going to have another year like last year. I think look, I mean, everybody's suffering. All right, right. Maryland's suffering is, yeah. with ticket sales. Yeah. Uh, the NFL is suffering across. But the difference with the NFL is. Well, the TV contract, it it almost it does matter, right? Because a game in front of an empty stadium becomes a studio game. Yeah, but the thing is, that the NFL isn't down like a greater percentage than the rest of TV. I think that, I mean, you can just look at where it ranks every week in terms of, I mean, like it was the seven of the ten top rated TV shows of 2017. So, I mean, like there, there's no question. Oh, no, 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 no. They could, they could take a 10% hit. It would st- hurt them with advertisers. Right. But it's, and it probably wouldn't hurt them with advertisers. Exactly. But, but uh, and it has a lot to do with the proliferation of sports on TV. Like I read all these insane yeah. games that are on TV today. Of course. Well, I mean, they're, they're, if, if if fans are not apathetic, which is generally their default, they're up in arms over something. So it's it's either they're given something to care about and they either latch onto it either negatively or positively, or they generally don't care because there's a million other things that they can consider giving their time to. So, you know, it, it, again, like we let off the segment with it is what it is. It is what it is and there's no purpose. I just... Nothing to talk about. Nope. Whatever happens, happens. Yep. Uh, elsewhere around, Ryder Cup team. I wonder if, I wonder if at this moment that Jim Furyk is having doubts about that selection of Phil Mickelson. Tiger certainly no doubts. Bryson DeChambeau, he sh- you know, not even a question. All right. But you'd look at Xander Shoffley who now is minus 13 in position to possibly win uh, the BMW champion and be in the top six of the FedEx Cup. Wow. Does he not maybe deserve it more than Phil? All right. And Tony Finau, who's in there every week, a guy who's a birdie maker, one of the best guys uh, for the best ball segment of the Ryder Cup. I'm I'm wondering, and then you look at uh, Thomas Bjorn select Sergio. Sergio has played horrible. I don't get it. I mean, Ian Poulter's had a great year. Henrik Stenz has been off and on, and Paul Casey's had a good year. But how do you select Sergio? I I just don't understand it. I really don't. Legacy pick. I mean, I mean. Well, he's been there. He's got a great right. record. But you don't got the best record in the Ryder Cup. Who's that? I mean, from Europe, Ian Poulter. He's twelve and four. When you consider Tiger is that. below 500. No, I mean, but like, it seems like there are some certain players whose games play better for this sort of thing. I mean, like, I mean, Tiger is such an individual competitor that I'm not sure that uh, he necessarily gets up in the same way to, you know, piggyback off. No, of I think, I think, he, I think he cares about it no, as no, much no, no, more no, than I'm, anybody. I'm saying now, I'm saying, I mean, I'm saying, I'm, 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 I mean, back in the day, he might not, when he was in his prime, he might not have cared as much about the Ryder Cup, I don't think. I mean, I, I think now, this is the perfect opportunity, like, this is the perfect thing for Tiger. This is everything to him. This is everything to him. Look. I can't wait to watch this. 62 on Thursday. Okay, he shot party yesterday. He's still five shots within the lead. This guy has established himself as one of the top 10 or 15 players in golf. Absolutely. Now. Relevant. Now. 100%. All right. Is he going to dominate? No. But that's good. Right. But here's the thing. If if Dustin Johnson, if uh, uh, Brooks Kepka, if Roy McIlroy, and all these other guys played during the Tiger dominance. He wouldn't have dominated as much then. Absolutely. If he was playing the same guys who he was playing back then, he'd be dominating, okay? But he's not. But the mere fact that he's rebounded to the top 15 of the world and by far, by late years, is the number one box office guy in uh, golf is absolutely uh, beyond belief. And, yeah, he's still a Nike guy, all right? <laughs> There's a lot of Nike guys. There are a lot of Nike guys right. out there. Not uh, Steph Curry. Levia, what? Not Steph Curry. Steph, he's, a, you know, he's an Iron Armor guy. You know, Durant's a Nike guy. Oh, yeah. Right? It's kind of funny, though. <laughs> maybe one day it'll be a war between them, you know. <laughs> I don't know. Listen, Under Armour's falling on some hard times. Not too bad, but uh, but not around here. Not, not around, around here. here. Not around here. You go, you go to the games and, you know. I had Under Armour stuff is everywhere, and I love it, but uh, I'm a little biased. <laughs> uh, Livy- Livion Bell is out. Sounds like he's out for good. And they were talking about, I was listening on the way in, how Mike Tomlin is overlooked as one of the best coaches in football. Dig this, all right? And 12-4, and 12-4, 8-8, 8-8, all right? 
10 and 6, 11 and 5, 12 and 4. Those are his last eight years. Give me a break. No, he's a Hall of Fame coach. Give me a break. The guy's unbelievable. He's amazing. He's amazing. I don't know. I don't, I'm not even going to try to speculate why he gets even remotely the hard time that he gets. I don't think he gets that hard of a time in Pittsburgh. Oh, I yes, think he I, does. Does he? Start reading the Pittsburgh Gazette after I should, a loss. I should probably. All right. He gets blistered every time. I mean, they'll take the most individual play. I told you my story. I got the chance to meet him, uh, Nestor, at one of the uh, events that he had for uh, the swab test right. and all that. He does a great job of that stuff. So the featured guests were Harbaugh and Tomlin. Well, obviously, everybody's around Harbaugh, but not me. Right. Because I've talked to John Harbaugh. I right. know John Harbaugh. I'm talking to Tomlin. And I said to him, I said, you know, Mike, I said – my greatest moments are when you lose a game and the Pittsburgh press all right, starts saying it's time for you to go because when you go, <laughs> Pittsburgh will never be the threat to Baltimore that right. it's been with you. And he says, I tell you what, it's noise to me right. when I hear that. So I don't even know they're living. That's what he said. It means nothing to me. I said, you're right, because you know how long it would take you to get another job? I said, you couldn't even <laughs> blink your eyes to right. get another job. Well, I mean, Harbaugh's the same way. And that's the thing with, with that. I think we're, when everyone's saying that, like, yeah, if they lose week 17 to the Browns and that keeps them out of the playoffs for the third straight year, I mean, like, it's hard to imagine Harbaugh coming back. I don't know, man. I, I think it's, I mean, it's, and it's hard to say the same thing. I was saying this this about Buck maybe four months ago. It's different now for the Orioles with 100 How many season. years has Buck been the manager? He took over in August of 2010. So you're going on eight years. You know, I think 10 years is like, yeah, it's the limit. Yeah, but I, I, what I'm saying, though, is like, it's Buck's value has gone down a little bit, but when you're talking about guys like Tomlin and Harbaugh and Buck until a few months ago, you're talking about guys where it's just like even if they have overstayed their welcome, it's so hard to make that change because you're not going to find someone who's well. Here's the as thing: last year, you're just not going to find it. You would think the Ravens went three and thirteen last year. They went eight and eight. Listen, and they they, 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 didn't, they were lucky. They were in the playoffs. They were so lucky. They were so lucky. They got so lucky with not only their schedule, but the good teams that they played, played their backup quarterbacks. They were so – they had every bit of help, and they still barely got to A&A. But they got to A&A. <laughs> they did. All right. They did. And they, look, they did. And they were a playoff team until the very last play of the season. Right or wrong? Right. You're correct. They were a playoff t- team the entire time until Cincinnati uh, threw that – Cincinnati, you know, that's why they have to win Thursday, I mean Sunday, because you're going to Cincinnati on on the following Thursday, and I don't care how down everybody is on Cincinnati, if there's a team that has our number, it's Cincinnati, it's not Pittsburgh, it's Cincinnati has our number, there's no doubt about it, what they've done to us over the years. Rafa Nadal, did you see that last night? I did. It's, 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 it's a shame. It is a shame, but you had to watch his previous match. It was ridiculous, all right? It was ridiculous. It went on and on and on. Five hours. I mean, it was crazy. Rafa Nadal. I mean, listen, I, 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 he's one of those great what-ifs in sports. I've loved watching him play. He really genuinely puts everything into his body every single match, and uh, I think we're all going to miss th- this group of players, including Del Potro. I'm happy for him that he's getting another opportunity deep into a tournament. Yeah, I certainly agree with you. All right, real quick. Got a minute left. Clemson 12 over, t- over Texas A&M. Dabo Sweeney opened up his mouth. I like Texas A&M in that game. Maybe not to win. Uh, Penn State eight and a half at Pitt. Uh, I think Penn State will come roaring out today. USC at Stanford. Take Stanford. I don't even know what the line is. And Sparty at uh, Michigan State at Arizona State. That's a good game tonight to watch late. That will do it. Go Terps. Uh, I see a 27 to uh, let's call it 17 game, a win for the Terps today. As I said before, they better win. But uh, that's it. Tomorrow in Tomorrow, the nest. In the nest. Science Nine o'clock. Presents. Science of Kirk. Can't wait. Carl be in the building. Carl Donald. Donald. Yeah. Problem with uh, Levinson. He's holding out on me for more money. <laughs> All right. Like Le'Veon Bell, he's holding out. That'll do it. Have a great weekend, everybody. Stay safe.
Radio 1300.